Uh, it's great to be here. So a quick romp around what I hope uh, the Smart Cities uh, strand will be about. I think we all know that cities are on the crossroads. We heard that this morning. They have to decide where they're going. We all know that cities... It's Charles Landry. Vitality, ...oxygen, if you like it, and that they want to be magnetic and compel people, interesting people from all over the place to come and, and live there. Unfortunately, we still build cities uh, continually that aren't really what we've been talking about this morning and what the topic uh, of this Congress is about. And perhaps the problem is, and I'm just using computer language just for today, uh, we might call this hardware-driven approach, hard infrastructure-driven approach, uh, City 1.0, an old-fashioned way of doing things that doesn't really work. That doesn't mean I don't think engineering is fantastic, things need to stand up, but that focus on, on, on that alone perhaps doesn't make the sort of cities we want. And many cities are realising, obviously, this is Athens, different problem, austerity, obviously, but many cities are obviously thinking through, what do we do next? And I'm just adapting Einstein's phrase, the thinking that got you to where you are won't be the thinking that gets you to where you want to be. And obviously, I think we've already discussed this morning and we'll continue to discuss what is the next phase, plan B, if you like, and what would that look like? Now, is that called City 2.0? Forgive this City 1.0, 2.0 stuff. Uh, I don't know, but one of the key issues about it is that it's essentially about soft urbanism. It's about retrofitting the reality. It's blending hardware thinking and software thinking together. It's putting at the same level of status those that deal with the soft, the people, if you like, at the same level as those who deal with the hard and physical. Uh, and that's quite important uh, organisation because it's not normally like that. So what this is about is understanding the emotional context of cities. I sometimes call the sensory landscape of cities because our first entry point into the city is really through the senses and what that does to us. Does it repel us? Does it attract us? And so on. And that, of course, is about the conditions to meet, talk, play, do things together, trade, and so on. And as someone said earlier this morning, replacing, putting in, blending in, soul into the city, which is that intangible thing. Because you can tick all the boxes of all the facility things, but that still doesn't often make the type of city we want. And there are hundreds of examples around the world. This just happens to be in the <coughs> park. You know, that's just one example of doing so. That retrofitting process. Another is, of course, the High Line in New York, uh, and also 42nd Street. And all of these examples you know of. And this is also, of course, happening in smaller cities too. But perhaps it's also about, given that we're talking about smart cities, City 3.0, apologies again. Um, but what that really understands is that the way the economic system and all of that works together is less having just one idea, one producer, one distributor going to households and so on. It understands much more the way that small entities working together, collaborating, networking, less chunky big companies, uh, sometimes they are, but mostly not, working with interesting supply chains and all of that, arriving ultimately to those households and so on. So you can see, if you just think about these three models of the city, I and mean, they're all part of the same thing in the ideal world, require different priorities and different ways of organizing and managing. Now, within that, of course, there is the here-there phenomenon. We're here, we're there, we're blending the virtual and the physical together. You can see that if you just look around the place, uh, you can have movable offices, a nomadic culture you see around the great German invention, by the way. Um, the pop-up culture, things are less stable than before. So each of these developments, as in technology, has its disadvantages and advantages, because great places are, of course, places of anchorage, places of possibility, places of connection, places of self-realization. So all of these things are a double-edged sword. And within that, of course, people talk a lot about network thinking, uh, thinking but that also means how does physical space work in that type of context. 
It's a fragile affair, as we know. Things are unstable. We're moving into a predictable context where we're going less to plan the predict and provide and the predict and provide model to more creating conditions whereby we can become more adaptive in one way or another. Some people think the remedy is smart cities. Everywhere you go, there are congresses, expos. This is last year, Congress in Barcelona, expos in Bologna, everywhere you go, everybody's talking about this. So here are some of the questions that I hope will be asked in, in, in this session tomorrow. The first, where did this come from, this idea? Was the idea simply the fact that we've got data mountains, that we know what they're like, that we can insert intelligence into them through the way we analyse these data mountains? Or did the idea come from simply as a response to austerity and other issues? Secondly, what can it do? What can this stuff do? And what can it be? Well, clearly you'll know it's about smart sensors, grids and all of that, activating things and all and I said this morning, connecting everything to everything. And of course, that changes the nature of how the world operates. So it's all about these devices. The question is, we'll come back to the question about all these devices in a minute. Thirdly, what is the intent, which is the most important thing? What is the intent when people say smart city? What are they after? What do they want? Do they want something that is about what you've just said today, and what Joe just talked about? which is, let's say, social inclusion, social justice and all that, or is it the opposite? Because these technologies can do both things. They can you know, act as surveillance, they can do all sorts of things that are incredibly negative. So the intent is important. What is the promise? What is the promise? I hope that's answered. What's the promise of smart cities? This is in one of those big events. This looks like a 50s ad for a refrigerator. But in fact, that's about smart cities. But anyway, it's a difficult hack. It's quite nice and fetching. Uh, anyway, so the promise of this is clearly that it's you know this immersive, self-regulating, interoperable, interactive devices that help us visually track things and so on, which of course is fantastic, which enables creativity potentially to flourish, and there is an efficiency to the in that. That's the promise of this whole smart uh, smart city thing. About efficiency, apparently about empowerment, all of these issues. I think they may be true, but I think we should always be criti critical in thinking that through. Not because we want to be negative, but because we need to be aware of what the real deeper dynamic forces are that are involved in that. Because there are some people who are very critical of all of this. So what are the criticisms about this? The criticisms are that there are different views of this, that it's not really, that it's a slightly controlling thing, this smart city group, it has controlling aspects, it needs itself controlling. And these divergent views are often incredibly stark. Uh, there are some that say, some of the major companies, of course, you know, smartcities.com is owned by IBM, nothing against an IBM, but it does own the concept. Does it, what is its aim? Is its aim we buy the goods only, or has it got a bigger aim? Is it only about optimizing in its helping the bureaucracies rather than, sorry, is it only maximizing rather than optimizing as it's helping bureaucracies? And that's a very important question. <coughs> is it maximizing things or helping to optimize? So I'm getting confused myself. <laughs> Look, optimize is better than maximize, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> So are we optimizing the situation rather than maximizing? And some of the sharpest critics say, use this phrase, this is all about the urban intelligence industrial complex. So what I'm really saying is we need counterpoints. And just a couple of questions that might come in there. Isn't it dangerous when we're hardwiring urban services to a particular device and to particular companies? Is it not true that some of the best things about cities are apparently completely unproductive, but are in fact the most productive, like conviviality. Conviviality can build social capital. Social capital grows as you build it, whereas financial capital, the more you spend, the less you have. So, so those are some of the hopefully interesting, difficult questions we answer. Then we'll answer a few questions about the underlying issues. What should you solve? Clearly, we'll 
problems, the ones you have to address even though you don't know the, other, don't know the answer, and perhaps through co-creation processes. One of which, of course, is the open data room. We won't talk too much about that, I hope, but generally we all know that's happening and is allowing vast possibilities to do things. What are the government's issues? They may discuss, I hope they do, and these are really about aligning 19th, 20th century systems and ways of doing things, hierarchical things, and all of that to 21st century conditions. And it may be about behaviour change, because this guy measuring his energy output on a bike is perhaps the thing we want. And here's a horrible graffiti I saw in Zurich the other day, which is all about an ability car sharing. I'm not going to say what it says down there. But you can see that not well, everybody's going to respond to this in the way we want, but we are really interested in uh crap, it's a kind of tip. Uh, uh, we're interested in behavioural change. And here obviously the issue of the bureaucracy is quite interesting. I'm using the word bureaucracy in a positive sense, because its image of course is it's completely convoluted, it's not necessarily always, but it's generally inefficient, it's not necessarily always. But it's a bit formulaic, a bit one size fits all, it doesn't understand the texture of things and how things operate in a more fine brain. Basically, I find the point is that perhaps this bureaucracy needs to change from its focus on law to more, and the best bureaucracy that I've seen, a more focus on shifting towards intent, guidelines, proposals, suggestions. So you're strategically principled and tactically flexible, which guides the way development goes. And that, of course, requires trust. So finally, what are the ways forward? Clear, we do want intelligent, creative, smart, etc., etc., cities, but that requires creative citizens, which has more to do with their mind and other things than technology itself. And that, of course, is about what we all bring to the party. Thank you very much.